See, it's, it's a mistake. Don't think you really have an arm. He does. We don't. And what's the proof? The proof is his arm can split a sea. What can my arm do? Does God really speak or are that just humans? Okay, let's see. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And I say to my children, let's have some quiet. <laughs> nothing happens. I say it again, nothing happens. So who really speaks? But that is the point. When I was growing up, right after the war, we came to America in 1950 from Tashkent. And uh, the community in New York, in Brooklyn, was very pessimistic, depressed. It was hard getting, a, getting accustomed to the new country with a new language. So the, the, the religious community was very, very depressed, and they were convinced that they were the last generation. There wasn't going to be another observant or from generation. That was it. My grandfather said to me once, can you promise me that you'll at least keep Shabbat? <laughs> because that was, that was the attitude, that in America, it's not going to work. So they thought that they were the last ones, and it was all over. So even on happy occasions, even on Yom Tov, when they would daven, it was always crying and sad and krechzing. <laughs> but we lived in, in, in Brooklyn, in Crown Heights, and there was one place on Eastern Parkway that was different. It was alive. There was activity going on all the time during the night, the day. They were singing. They danced in the streets. It was so different. That was the Rebbe. So as a teenager, of course, what, what, would I, what would you prefer? Listen to old people crying? <laughs> or seeing an activity, uh, excitement? So of course, we started going to the Rebbe. So uh, my parents had eight children, and we all became Chabad. It was, it was irresistible. I mean, how can you, how can you not get excited where there is excitement when every place else is depressed and giving up. So it became our goal that to, as soon as we're old enough, which means when you're married, we're going to go someplace to a Jewish community and devote ourselves to, uh, to showing the world what the Torah really is and what God is really all about and make the world a better place. And there's no exaggeration that uh, the 4,000 shluchim that the Rebbe has, which is very few, we need 4 million. Especially since the non-Jewish world has become very, very interested in learning from Torah. In Korea, the best-selling book is the Gemara, mm -hmm. the Talmud. I don't know what they're doing with it, but they, huh? Yeah, yeah. So on the YouTube, as you mentioned, millions and millions of listeners, they're not all Jews. They're mostly non-Jews, but they want to know because they're disappointed with their own religion. So they want to know from Jews what's the truth. And that, I think, is the main point. What's the truth? That's what Hasidus and the, the Rebbe, beginning with the Alta Rebbe, made the emphasis on find the truth. You know, you can be very religious and not even think it's true. This is our way, this is what we do, this is how we eat, 
This is how we celebrate. Is it true? Who cares? I like it. I get honor for being from. So I don't care if it's true, it's not true. That's not, that's not the Chabad way. The Rebbe insisted that everything has to be absolutely true. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. There's no games. For example, every Jew knows that you have to love your, every other Jew. Ava Sisro. So I ask a Frum guy, I said, do you have Ava Sisro? You love Jews? He says, of course. I said, of course? That means you don't like anybody. <laughs> what do you mean, of course? You know that there are some Jews that are very hard to love? <laughs> I'll, I'll introduce you to them. <laughs> I'll show you a few people that are very hard to love. What do you mean, of course? So what does that mean? Of course. Well, I'm a religious. And part of the religion is that you have to love every Jew. So I love every Jew. No, you don't. You simply accepted the idea, but you don't love any Jews. So that is not acceptable. Because it's not MS. It's not true. So I was sitting in an airport. I think it was Chicago. Years ago. A guy comes over. He sits down next to me. He's a missionary. He sits down next to me and he starts giving me a lecture. He says, every word in the Bible is true. It's the word of God. The Bible is true. You can't disprove it. No matter what the scientists say, the Bible is true. It's the word of God. Everything is true. He goes on and on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't disagree. Then he says, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he never introduced himself. He never... He said, oh, I'm sorry. What is your relationship with the Bible? So he used the word relationship. So I said, my relationship with the Bible? I'm a Kohen. Which means that Aaron is my grandfather. Which means that Moshe is my uncle. And Miriam is my aunt. His mouth fell open. He didn't know what to say. He got all uh, flustered, and he walks away. So I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute. He just finished telling me that every word in the Bible is true. So why was he so shocked that, Ad that Aaron had grandchildren? <laughs> why is that so shocking? There was Aaron, and he had children, and he has great-grandchildren. Why was he so shocked he couldn't even speak? So I realized when religious people say that the Bible is true, they mean I believe it's true. Is it really true? Who knows? But if you're religious, you say it's true. But Right? Because you're supposed to say that. You're supposed to believe that. But it's so true that he actually has grandchildren. Oh, that's more true than I ever, he got all flustered and couldn't handle it. So this is, this is the story. We are the children of the Torah. So when it says, speak to the children of Israel, who are they talking about? Who are these children of Israel? We. So this is real. The Torah says that we were slaves in Egypt. God took us out of Egypt, brought us to Har Sinai 50 days later, and gave us the Torah. What did it say in the Torah? That there was a man named Noyach, and in his time there was a huge flood, and everybody died except for Noyach and his family who were in an ark that landed on, ha on Mount Ararat in uh, Turkey. When Moshe told this to the people, 
Did they not already know the story? It was only 400 years since Avraham. Avraham knew Noyach. They were friends. In fact, Avraham sat Shiva when Noyach died. He was 58 years old when Noyach died. So he, Avraham lived like 180 years. So Yitzchak knew about Noyach from his father. Yaakov knew about Noyach from his grandfather. These are the children of Yaakov who came out of Mitzrayim. They didn't know the story of, of Noyach. So if the story hadn't been true, nobody would have believed it. They would say, what are you talking about? We never heard such a story. They had heard the story. Everybody had heard the story. So what was the Torah telling us that we didn't know? We didn't know what God was thinking when the flood happened. But everybody knew that a flood happened. So in the Torah, God is telling us his side of the story. That we didn't know. Like we didn't know why did Hashem pick Noyach? Why was he so upset that he had to wipe out everybody? That we didn't know. But who didn't know that there was a flood? Everybody got wet. <laughs> so it had to be true or nobody would have believed it. But even more than that, in the second book of the Torah, it says that the Jews were slaves in Mitzrayim and they came out of Mitzrayim and they were brought to the ocean, to the sea, and the sea split, and they went through the sea, and they came to Har Sinai, and God gave them Ten Commandments. Who was that said to? To the people who were in Egypt, who went across the sea, and who stood at Har Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. You can't tell them that this happened to them if it didn't happen to them. So everything that the Torah tells the people happened to them. They made a golden calf, and God was angry at them, and, uh, and Moshe broke the luchas. It happened to them. You can't tell them a story that isn't true about them. So every word in Torah is true. Not because we believe it's true, but because it has to be true, or nobody would have believed it. So it's all factual. So I want to tell you something really interesting. If somebody says to you, God's hand split the sea. You say, God has a hand? Does God have a hand? God's eyes are on the land of Israel all the time. He watches Israel special. God has eyes? God spoke. Really? God speaks? He has a mouth? What do we, how do we understand all this? So almost every rabbi in the world will tell you that he doesn't have a hand and he doesn't have eyes and he doesn't have a mouth and he doesn't really speak and he doesn't really get angry and he doesn't really love and he doesn't really hate and he doesn't... Those are all human behavior. But God doesn't have any of that. So why do we say he does? It's just a, a way of explaining. It always bothered me. Every other page in the Torah. God spoke, God said, God saw, God heard, God liked, God didn't like, and none of that is true. So one day, I uh, come into the house, and my granddaughter, who was like six years old, was crying because her doll broke. The arm came off. So I sat down with her, and I said, I'm so sorry. I can't imagine how much it hurt the doll when the arm came off. So she started to laugh, 
And she says, it didn't hurt. I said, what do you mean? The arm came off. She said, it's not a real arm. I said, why not? She said, it's plastic. I said, oh, right, 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 right. An arm made out of plastic is not really an arm. We call it an arm because it looks like an arm, but it's not a real arm. What's a real arm? Oh, a real arm has to have a bone and it has to have skin. Wait, that's a real arm. That's a bone with skin on it. Why is that a real arm? It's not. God has a real arm. We are created in his image, so we have something that looks like maybe a little bit of an arm. <laughs> so we got it backwards. When the rabbis say, no, no, don't take it literally. Don't think God really has an arm. See, it's, it's a mistake. Don't think you really have an arm. He does. We don't. And what's the proof? The proof is his arm can split a sea. What can my arm do? Does God really speak or is that just humans? Okay, let's see. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And I say to my children, let's have some quiet. <laughs> nothing happens. I say it again, nothing happens. So who really speaks? God gets angry. No, human beings get angry. Human beings lose control. <laughs> That's not real anger. God gets angry. In other words, God is real. We are the ones that are not. That means we're recognizing the truth. What's really real? What's truly true? Taita tells us what is really true. What we think is true, no. This generation should be able to understand this a lot better than ever before. Because now that we have technology, you have uh, microscopes, atomic microscopes. You take a look at anything on this table. You think that's a cup and it's plastic and it's solid and it can hold a liquid. Put it under a microscope. It's not solid. It's not plastic. It's not. So we see that our vision, the way physical things appear, is not the truth. God is true, and we are trying to imitate him because we're created in his image. But if you're going to imitate him, you have to be real and honest, not make-believe. This is the appeal or the effect that Hasidus has on people. Let me give an example. Uh, the Rebbe started the project of the Tefillin campaign. Yeah, you from sure. So you have little boys running around with a truck with music, and they stop people in the street and they say, excuse me, are you Jewish? Yes? Would you like to put on Tefillin? Now, look, look at what happens in the conversation between the average man and this Chabad boy. The boy says, would you like to put on tefillin? The man says, no, thank you. The boy says, it's a mitzvah. The man says, yeah, but I'm not religious. The boy says, but it only takes a minute. The man says, I'm not religious. The boy says, if you put on tefillin, it helps the soldiers in Israel. It protects them from... The man says, I'm not religious. 
So I'm sure you put on tefillin because you're religious. I don't put on tefillin because I'm not religious. And the boy is rolling up his sleeve. <laughs> and he's got the tefillin out. And he says, say, say, Baruch Atah. The guy says, Baruch Atah. I really shouldn't be doing this because I'm not religious. No, no, no. Finish the bracha. <laughs> he puts the tefillin on. The man starts to cry. Almost always. Gets emotional. What happened over here? How, how come they weren't communicating? The man is thinking, you ask me if I want to put on tefillin. I told you no, because I'm not religious. Don't you understand that? So you tell me it only takes a minute. I don't care if it takes a minute, an hour, a year. I'm not religious. The boy says, it's a big mitzvah. <laughs> We're not communicating here. You do it because you're religious. I don't do it because I'm not religious. What don't you understand? The boy, on the other hand, grew up Chabad. Nobody ever told him that he should put on tefillin because he's religious. We never heard such words. You put on tefillin because you're a Jew. So he's thinking, look, I asked you if you're Jewish. You said yes. What are you hacking me a cup with religion, a lot religion, this religion? You said you're Jewish, so here are your tefillin. You don't have time. It only takes a minute. <laughs> and this guy is saying, I have all the time in the world. I'm not religious. In the boy's mind, he's not religious either. Nobody ever told me I'm religious. I was told I'm a Jewish boy. A Jewish boy puts on tefillin. So you're a Jewish guy, put on tefillin with me. We're the same. We're both Jewish. That's what the Rebbe did. The Rebbe took away this, this religious uh, fantasy. A Jew is a Jew, and a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Are you religious? Where in the Torah does it say the word religion? It's not in the Torah. That's modern Hebrew. In modern Hebrew, there's a word for religion. In the Torah, there's no such word. That's called real. Real. Emes. You put on tefillin because you're the Jew who God created tefillin for. Do you enjoy it? That's, that's not the question. Do you do every other mitzvah? That's not the question. So when a person says, I'm religious, what does that mean? What does that mean? Hasidus makes everything real. I get on a plane, and I'm putting my things up on the... And there's a guy sitting right next to where I'm going to be sitting. So I said to him, do you know what time it is? I needed to know the time. You know what time it is? He says, just because I don't keep all the rituals doesn't mean I'm not a Jew. I'm just as Jewish as you. <laughs> what did I say? Why are you attacking me? Hey, you think I'm not Jewish? This idea that even if I don't do any of the mitzvot, I am a Jew, as Jewish as everybody else, is that true? It's absolutely true. So why doesn't he put on to him? Uh, good question. Why do some mothers not like their children? And if you don't like your children, they're not your children. The fact, the reality, is much more real than how you feel today. Because today you feel like this, tomorrow you feel like that. That's not how you measure reality. Torah is true because a Jew is a Jew. It's real. It's fact. It's the ultimate truth. 
I have to tell you a very funny story. There was a rabbi in Israel who was a real genius in everything. He was one of the few brains uh, in the generation. And he would teach Gemara, Talmud, at the university in Yerushalayim. All the professors came because it was brilliant. It was a brilliant class. There was one professor who they invited, and he refused to come. For three years, they kept inviting him, wouldn't come. One day, the rabbi happened to be at the same event with this professor. So the rabbi said to him, oh, you're in, the, you're in that department. We have a class in your building in the university on Talmud. All your friends, your colleagues come. Come also, you'll enjoy. He says, no, no, no. I don't belong at a Talmud class because you and I have nothing in common. So the rabbi said, well, what, are you, what are you talking? What are you saying? He says, you don't know me. I came to Israel after the war as a teenager and I decided to eat chazir on Shabbos. I eat pork on Shabbos. So the rabbi said, well, only on Shabbos? <laughs> the man said, yeah, dafke on Shabbos. In spite, dafke, on Shabbos I eat pork. So the rabbi said, no, you said we don't have anything in common. We both celebrate Shabbos. <laughs> the professor started coming to the class. But he explained to the other professors, it wasn't the joke that made him change his mind. The rabbi was saying something very, very profound in the joke. He was saying to him like this, uh, you eat pork. Why? Because you're angry at God for the Holocaust. You ate pork because that's the most un-Jewish thing you could think of. Because you ask any guy, do Jews eat pork? No. So everybody knows Jews don't eat pork. So he wanted to eat pork because it's the biggest, most popular sin. So he was eating pork and it didn't feel like enough of a punishment. So he decided he's going to eat the pork on Shabbat. Aha! Uh -huh. So the rabbi was saying to him, listen to yourself. We have nothing in common. You don't belong at a Talmud class. What are you saying? You believe in God more than most people. Otherwise, who are you angry at? You believe that God runs the world. That's why he's responsible for the Holocaust. He wasn't on vacation. You believe in the Torah that says that pork is not kosher. And you believe that Shabbat is a holy day. That's why eating the pork on Shabbat feels even better than eating it on Tuesday. Right? So you believe in God. You believe he runs the world. You believe in kosher. You believe in the Torah. You believe in Shabbat. You're almost orthodox. <laughs> you don't belong at a Talmud class. This is so incredible. And if you suspected that this rabbi was a Chabad rabbi, you're right. This is the way to look at truth. You look from, the, from outside, oh, he eats pork, not religious, that's it. I don't even know if he's Jewish anymore. What are you talking about? A person like him he is so Jewish, truly Jewish. He's just missing some details. You got to fill in a few details, you know. So his diet is a little off. Whose diet is not a little off? <laughs> <laughs> the Jew in him came out, and that's what the whole project that the Rebbe started 
with, with mitzvahs. Men should put on tefillin, women should light Shabbos candles. All of the mitzvahs that the Rebbe wanted meant one thing. Don't tell me how religious you are or how non-religious you are. Tell me if you're a Jew. And if you're a Jew, come. It's yours. Emes. And that attitude is much more productive than trying to make someone religious. Like, let me prove to you that the Torah is true. Let me prove to you that there is a God. I've seen this so many times. I'm talking to a student who says he doesn't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I believe in science. I don't believe in God. There's no God. It's all, it's all a myth and it's all... I say to him, you know, that's very sad because God needs you to put on tefillin. He says, really? <laughs> all of a sudden, he's interested. A minute ago, you said you don't believe in God. Yeah, but if he needs me, I'm not going to say no to him. So instead of arguing, yes, there's a God, who else created the world? I'll approve it and argue. What is the truth? The truth is, God created you a Jew, and he needs you to put on tefillin. So you say, well, I don't believe in God. That's not going to help you. <laughs> so, I don't believe I'm Jewish. Yeah, but you are. <laughs> so arguing is not going to make any difference, right? Another interesting story. The student from University of Minnesota, we lived in Minnesota, he comes running over to the Chabad house. He runs inside. He's in a panic. <laughs> he says, Rabbi, am I going to hell? I said, knowing you, probably. <laughs> he said, I'm serious. I said, why? He wasn't, he wasn't religious. He wasn't observant. He wasn't. I said, why? What, what, what's the matter? He has a roommate who keeps telling him that if he doesn't convert to Christianity, he's going to go to hell. So first, he laughed at him. Then he like played along a little bit. Now he's worried. Am I going to hell? So I said, you know, there's a rabbi on campus. Why didn't you ask him? He came 40 minutes to drive from the campus to the Chabad house. Why'd you have to come here? Why didn't you ask the rabbi on campus? He says, I did ask him. I said, what did he say? He said, we don't believe in hell. He was a conservative rabbi. He says, we, we don't believe in hell. I said, you don't like that answer? He says, it's not an answer. I don't want to know what you believe. I want to know if I'm going. <laughs> he says, if I end up in hell, what am I going to say? The rabbi doesn't believe in this. <laughs> what is the truth? That's all people want to know. The truth is that Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is the purpose for which God created the world. It's not a religion. It's what he expects, what he needs, his purpose. So if you do what he needs, is that a religion? No. If you do what you need, it's a religion. I need to get blessings. I need to be special, I need to go to heaven, I need to be protected and saved. That's religion. But that's what you need. Torah was never a religion. And that's why there's no word for religion in the Torah. Jews were never religious. We're not even good at it. We hate being religious. We stood at Har Sinai. God said, don't make any idols. 40 days later, we made an idol. <laughs> just to see what would happen. <laughs> We're not religious. We don't just obey 
you know, for, for mysterious religious reasons. If God wants and asks me, of course I'm going to do it. But that's real, not religion. And that's why even if a Jew does convert to another religion, he's still a Jew. Nothing changed. Because you can't change reality. You can change religion, because religion is not real. So there was a very nice man, a nice Jewish boy, whose parents were, uh, were very worried during the Holocaust. And so they put, they put the child, the boy, into an orphanage, which was Catholic. So he grew up in the, they died in, the, in, in Auschwitz, and he grew up in this, uh, he was a smart boy, so of course he was the best in the class. And he grew up, he became the Archbishop of France. Archbishop is like one step away from Pope. <laughs> like about it, almost as high as you can go in the, he was the Archbishop of France. His name was Lustig. When he thought that he was, gonna, he was getting older and he was thinking about his funeral, he knew that the church would make a big deal, a big person. He asked the local rabbi if he would come and say Kaddish at, at the uh, ceremony. The rabbi said, at the ceremony, in the church, no. I'm not going to say Kaddish, but at the, at the cemetery, by the burial, we'll have a minion, we'll say Kaddish, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be buried like a Jew. An entire life spent being a priest, a bishop, an archbishop, in the end, say Kaddish. A Jew is a Jew. He happened to be a talented Jew. <laughs> So he made it to the highest ranks, but he never stopped being a Jew. That's true. That's true. So when you come to a Jew, you don't ask him, would you like to become religious? <laughs> That's not Jewish. That's not real. It's not true. But when you stop a Jew and you say, excuse me, are you Jewish? Boy, what that does to the person. Can you imagine? Stop a guy in the street and say, excuse me, are you Jewish? He says, yeah. Why, why, why are you asking me that? No, nothing, nothing. Bye, say gesund. <laughs> you just ruined his life. He, now he can't sleep. Why did he ask me? Why, why did he ask me if I'm Jewish? Yeah, I'm Jewish. Okay, I don't go to the synagogue, but, but I'm, I don't keep kosher. My father, my grandfather... Oh, it, his whole life is starting to unravel because somebody asked him, are you Jewish? So what if this guy says, yeah, I'm Jewish, but I don't believe in God. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> what you believe, you don't believe. I asked you if you're Jewish, now you're stuck. Because now you have to deal with a simple truth. Because you are a Jew. So what are you doing? That's, that's, what, that's what the Baal Shem Tev revolutionized. Because people, Jews, were so discouraged from being religious that they felt that they were failing. The Baal Shem Tev came along and said, why are you trying to be religious? Who asked you to be religious? Be a Jew. Be a Jew. So if you know about tefillin, so put on tefillin. You don't have tefillin. So eat latkes on Hanukkah. Is that a big mitzvah? I don't know. It's Jewish. So you do it. That's, that's the MS. And that's why the non-Jewish world is coming to the Jews all over the world and asking, what's, what's really true? We don't know anymore. 
What did God say at Har Sinai? We don't know. We, we, we changed the Ten Commandments. We messed up the whole. We don't know anymore. So tell us. Tell us what. And that's the prediction, the prophecy, that the last Novi gave us is that before Moshiach comes, the non-Jews are going to come to the Jewish people and say, show us the way. That is happening all over the world. So on the YouTube, we have people listening every week from Africa, from China, from Vietnam, from Germany, not Jews, from New Guinea, they all want to know what's real, what's true. Because if we don't know, it's not healthy. It's not healthy to not know why we exist. It's not healthy to not know why we were created. So you have people today who are suing their parents to pay all their bills for the rest of their lives because they gave birth to them without asking them. <laughs> there was one young woman here in America sued her parents in court, and she won. She won. But, you know, it sounds funny, but when you think about it, isn't she right? You gave birth to me without asking me. And now I have to go to school and pay bills. How does that make sense? Not fair. <laughs> it's not fair. I never promised. I never agreed. I never signed a contract. What do you mean I have to pay bills? What is that? It's wrong. I shouldn't have to pay anything. I didn't do anything. You decided to give birth to me, so you paid a bill. Makes a lot of sense. It's like, you can't invite me to a very expensive restaurant, and then after we finish eating, you tell me to pay the bill? How does that make sense? So people are actually saying, I don't understand life. I didn't ask for this. So why, why am I obligated either to make a living or to be religious? Oh, you have to be religious. I don't have to anything. You made this mess. You clean it up. <laughs> why do I have to clean it up? This is such a fundamental question that even children are asking. You've heard this from, from your children or grandchildren? I didn't ask to be born. They're not, they're not that brave. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere in the world, children are saying, what do you want from me? I have to clean up my room? I didn't ask to be born. What is the answer? What do we tell children? You didn't ask to be born. Well, too bad. Too bad? <laughs> Not only that. The child says, I didn't ask to be born. And the mother says, neither did I. <laughs> I so why should I pay the bill? <laughs> so go to your grandmother. You go to the grandmother. The grandmother says, uh, I didn't ask to be born either. So who, who's responsible for all this? Adam and Chava. If we don't know why we're here, it becomes very hard to function. I don't understand why I have to get up every morning and go to school. I have to get up every morning and go to work. Why? Who did this to me? And if you don't have an answer, it's painful. So people are listening online, on YouTube, 
They want to hear what's going on. Why am I here? They're not suicidal. They don't want to die. But they don't feel like they're really living either. Because if you don't know why you're living, it's hard to live. So a famous American writer, I think he was American, he wrote like this. He had, had many, many wise statements. He said, the two most important days in your life. The two most important days of your life is the day you're born. Right. The first is the day you're born. And the second is the day you find out why. <laughs> For what? And the second day is much more important than the first one. Because if you don't know what you were born for, you can't. You can't. Why are we asking the question now and not 100 years ago? Because 100 years ago, we were busy. We had no time. There was no time to think. You had to work or you're, or you're dead. Today, you don't have to work. Imagine waking up your child in the morning saying, come on, wake up, wait, it's late. He says, late for what? <laughs> for the bus, for the school bus. So why do I have to get on a school bus? Well, you gotta go to school. Why do I have to go to school? Because you gotta get good grades and get into high school. Why do I have to go to high school? Because from there you can get into college. Well, why do I have to go to college? to get a job. Why do I need a job? To make money. Why do I need money? To pay the mortgage. Why do I need a house? Well, what do you want to do? Live in the streets? You get sick and die. You're going to get sick and die. So the kid said, that's why I have to get up now. Because <laughs> 40 years from now, I'm going to be homeless. And... See, it doesn't make sense anymore. In the olden days, the farmer woke up his son and said, come on, we've got to go uh, plow, and, and, because if not, the winter is coming, we're going to die. So the, kid, so the kid got up. But you say now to a kid, get up, we're going to die. <laughs> Who's going to die? When die? What are you talking about? Well, you're going to end up homeless. You're going to die. No, I won't. I'll go on welfare. <laughs> Nobody dies anymore from not having money. So all of a sudden, this big, big question that we never asked before is becoming very popular. I didn't ask to be born means I don't need to be born. So the big, big, big question now is, if I don't need to be born, who needs me to be born? I used to think it was me. It's not me, then who? And the answer is the creator. Oh, well then let's figure out what he wants. How do we figure out what he wants? Ah, he gave us a Torah to tell us what he wants. Okay, let's read the Torah. One more story and I have to go. <clears throat> I'm fabinging like this, with about 50 students at a conference. The best students, the most active Jewish students of all the campuses in America, they had a conference. And my job was to fabring at midnight with these 50 students. There was one student there who was uh, a scientist, studying science, an engineer. He started with questions. Questioning, another question, another question, debating back and forth for hours. We started at midnight, the sun was coming up, and he still had questions. <laughs> From the 50 students, there were about four left. So we're all getting tired already, and it's, you know, it's, there was one Israeli student was sitting there the whole night. Now, early in the morning, he said to the engineer, to the other student, 
He said, you know, I sit here all night listening to your questions, and I don't understand what your problem is. I grew up on a kibbutz. I didn't know about Yom Kippur until I came to America. They told us nothing about Judaism on the kibbutz. All I know is my people, my parents, my ancestors came out of the desert and they had five books. The Bedouins have been in that desert for thousands of years. They don't have one book. So if I were you, I would shut up and read the book. <laughs> so why? It's about your parents. What do you mean, why? Oh, I'm not religious. I don't believe in the Bible. Who's asking you to believe? Read about yourself. Because the whole Torah is a story of you. Your name is on every page. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell the children of Israel. The children of Israel messed up again. <laughs> it's all about you. So read it. That's, that's the approach that we have to take. Rosh Hashanah is coming. What's Rosh Hashanah? The anniversary of creation. Yeah, the head of the year. What happens at the head of the year? Well, we're starting a new year. We have new possibilities. You, you don't have to be the same person you were last year. It's a new year. It can be a new you. So we come to the synagogue, we blow the shofar, and we tell God, last year, we didn't do so good. We had a year, and we didn't make good use of it. But this year, we don't want to waste any time. This year, we want it to be a really good year. So thank you for giving me the year, and I will try to make it better than last year. That's Rosh Hashanah. Not Rosh Hashanah is God is going to judge you, and if you're not good, he's going to kill you. What, 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 kind, what kind of ridiculous attitude that is? Oh, it's a day of judgment. You're in trouble. Who says you're in trouble? Who says you're in trouble? You're not as good as your grandparents. They weren't as good as their grandparents. <laughs> Who says you're in trouble? Here's the bottom line. How do we know we're Jewish? Because 3,335 years ago, in the, de in the Sinai Desert, God came down to Mount Sinai and said, will you be my people? And we said yes. And now we're stuck. <laughs> when is the last time God spoke to us as a people? Mount Sinai. So for 3,300 years, he has not said a word to us. He sent prophets, he sent messages, but he did not come to talk to us again since Mount Sinai. 3,300 years. Approximately 2,000 of those 3,000 years were horrible, impossible years. We can't understand and nobody can understand how, we, how did we survive. We don't understand. They were impossibly difficult, horrible years. 2,000. Then there's the Holocaust. Now you're going to come and tell people, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, God is going to be judging us. And if we didn't do what we're supposed to do, we're going to die. You really think God is so cruel? Is there a single person today who is really responsible Or is it an absolute miracle that you're sitting here tonight? Probably because there's nothing interesting on television. Why are you sitting here tonight? 
It's the biggest miracle of all history that we are still Jewish. Are we as good? Do we keep all the mitzvot? Like, no. But whose fault is that? I mean, who actually got up one morning and said, you know what? I'm done with the mitzvot. I'm not doing it no more. Hardly anybody. And those who did do it is because they had too much suffering and too much pain. So when God judges us, is he going to see that we are not good? Or is he going to see that we are a miracle of goodness? What's the truth? The truth is, God is absolutely thrilled with his people. Because we have every justification and every excuse to quit. And we don't quit. So God is absolutely thrilled. Every Jew in the world today who thinks he's Jewish, who tells his children he's Jewish, deserves every reward. Punishment? After all of that? God is angry at us, doesn't talk to us for 3,000 years, puts us through 2,000 years of misery, and then he's angry at us? Not possible. It's not possible. He's absolutely thrilled. So when we come to the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, of course he's going to give us a year. Of course he'll give us a year. And he'll give us a good year. That's what we're afraid of. You know, when you die, you die. You got nothing more to be afraid of. But if you're going to live, oh, now you got to get serious. What are you going to do with this year of life? Same thing you did last year? Mm, not so good. That's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of life. We're not afraid of death. Death is stupid. Nobody should die. It's been done before. It's not nothing exciting about it. Life is exciting. So knowing that God is going to give us a Shana Tova, well, get serious. A year, you have to know how to use a year. Death, you don't have to know anything. Stupid people can die. <laughs> but to live, you have to have a little wisdom. That's what we're coming to the synagogue for. For the wisdom of life, because we're going to have life. That's what Chabad does. Everybody else is going to sit in the synagogue on, on Rosh Hashanah and cry and beg God not to die. <laughs> and God is going to look at them and say, what do you think I am? <laughs> what am I, a Kozak? Of course you're not going to die. You're the best thing in the world. But don't waste another year, please. Do something, make Mashiach come, so that the world can be what I always wanted it to be. A perfectly godly world in which there is no suffering and no pain and no evil and no sin and no crime. That's what I'm looking for. So if you can help me out, God says, if you can help me out, I would really appreciate it. So be my partner in making the world so instead of calling Judaism a religion, we call it a partnership. We are partners with God to make the world that is very low into the greatest, highest, holiest of all creation. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below, and see which, which of the three suits you best, and join us for some enjoyable conversation.